Hey guys, so today I'm joined by Steve Wells. So Steve Wells is, is an international coach and peak performance consultant. He's worked extensively with energy psychology, aka tapping. And today we're here to talk about tapping and tapping in sports and performance. Hey Steve, thanks for joining us today. Thanks James, great to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, I appreciate your time. I guess I want to start Steve by just talking about your journey in psychology. Would you mind just sharing how you started in psychology and just, yeah, maybe where you are now? What happened in between? All right. Well, as a psychologist, I'd like to go back to childhood, basically. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess there. <laughs> well, actually, that's where it started because I, I was interested in this stuff when I was 15 years old. But actually, um, what really got me into this field was uh, when I was 17, I was uh, going a little bit off the rails, you know, not hugely off the rails, but I was just, you know, spending more time socialising and out with my mates than, than doing anything to do with study. And I just basically let my studies completely drop. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, when you do the mock exam that you do before uh, going to university, back then when we did this, it was all based on that, that last two years of high school. You know, if you, if you fail the exams, you don't get in, you go and join the dog queue. And if you, you know, if you get a good enough score, you get in. That was your and, big you know, moment. So I comprehensively failed so badly that uh, I even surprised myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I had a teacher that actually said to me, you know, you'll never recover from that. And uh, as you know, sometimes that can be a motivating factor. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a bit of a mismatcher. You know, if you tell me I can't do something, I say, well, why can't I? Or if you say black, I look, I think white, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, you'll prove so. I'm wrong. <laughs> anyway, so that was actually helpful for me. Um, but I, I, I didn't know how, but I'm like, you know, I'll prove you wrong. And uh, like a couple of days later, I just chanced on this book. It was a, just a personal development book that my dad had in his bookcase for some reason. Yeah. And, um, and I read it and, uh, and I just got, I got excited by the possibility that you can turn things around from failure to success and possibility. And, uh, you know, I just basically started following the formula it was spelled out in that book, um, you know, which some of which I, I now, you know, think we can improve on, mm -hmm. but it really helped me at that time. And so then, uh, you know, I, I set my intention to get a score that, you know, according to that teacher and probably myself, I shouldn't have been able to get in a few short weeks. And so I was able to turn my performance around in that situation. And so then I got excited about, well, I want to, I want to share this with other people, you know, I want to teach other people to do this. And uh, I looked at possibilities and, um, and one of these guys, I read the book, he was like a career counselor. And I thought, yeah, well, that'd be a good thing to do. So where, you know, where, where, do, where do you do that kind of thing? Yeah. And uh, anyway, I, I set upon the idea of being a, what, what in the West Australia, they call guidance officer, like in the high school. Sure, um, sure. You have to be a school psychologist. So I had to study psychology. So that got me into studying psychology and um, and, and Steve, and, you, and you've, you've done a master's in psychology, correct? Yes, I have. Yes. Yeah. Later on, I, I did that. You know, I think I have the record for taking the longest to get it done. <laughs> how, how long was that? <laughs> oh, about 10 years. I was working at the time. So, yeah. you know, I went back and, uh, and did it. And I, and I did all the practical bits. Then we had a son and I took time out. And then, you know, then yeah. I did a bit more. And then I kind of, um, you know, deferred for another reason. and then. And by, I think by the time we had our twins, um, you know, I deferred again. And then I withdrew from the course, actually, or I thought I'd withdrawn. Yeah. And, uh, and actually what we're talking about, this tapping, was what got me back into it. Because I went back, um, I was invited back to, uh, you know, I, I shared about tapping with, um, with the guy who was my supervisor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, why don't you come and share that with the students? And so I came in and I, you know, I demonstrated the approach. And anyway, this lady that I had help with her supervision uh, to become a psychologist, she was there studying and she said, oh, I have to do this research project. And, um, and I said, well, that'd be easy. We just get a bunch of people with phobias and we'll, you know, we'll do a randomized controlled trial with, you know, we'll, and we'll do this tapping. Mm. And she says, oh, great. You know, would you, you know, I'd be really interested in doing that. Would you support me? And I said, sure. Anyway, so the guy in charge says, well, why don't you do a study as well? And then, you know, and then you can collaborate, you know, yeah. you've got to be separate studies, but 
then you can get your degree. So, mm -hmm. so, I, <laughs> so I did, you know, I had done all the practical stuff and some of the other stuff I kind of forced myself through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was, I was more interested in stuff that you could use and stuff that, that, that worked. And so all the, all the practical, you know, counseling courses and the therapy courses and all that, all that stuff that I could mm -hmm. instantly put into practice, yeah. that was what I was into. But anyway, I, I, I had got into um, school psychology. Then I had um, had an opportunity to work with emotionally disturbed kids, um, mm -hmm. running a, a resource center for kids with severe social, emotional, or behavioral problems. Yeah. And uh, and running a small team, coordinating that. And um, and and ultimately, I had a vision about what I wanted to create for adolescents, and they set me up in a program, and then. You know, I, I couldn't really work within that program for various reasons. There was some constrictions that stopped me from being able to manifest the vision that I wanted to yeah, manifest sure. and ended up leaving the system and working for myself. And uh, I've been working with adults ever since. And um, along the way, got into peak performance. <laughs> you know, I got into doing some corporate work as well as working with athletes. Yeah. Um, and um, then I found out about this tapping and I haven't looked back since then. So, Steve, I guess, like, when you first came across tapping and maybe you introduced it to other people, how did they respond to it? What was their initial reaction? Well, uh, often it was like mine. It was uh, disbelief, skepticism, um, in some cases, outright cynicism, you know. Yeah. Unfortunately, some of our peers, <laughs> our respected colleagues, yeah. um, you know, they won't even look at that real evidence. Like, okay, back then, fair enough. There wasn't a research base. Sure. And, um, you know, legitimately, you know, a lot of people run around and say, this is great, this is great, this is great. And that's why we do research, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's why I got involved in doing the research. I saw that it was a legitimate thing. There wasn't any, um, any good research that had been done at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I was sceptical and I would expect other to be, people to be sceptical. And for anyone that hasn't learned about this now, that would be a natural response. Yeah, like course, it, it yeah. seems ridiculous that you know stimulating acupressure points on the body by tapping on them will help you to relieve, you know, a, a host of issues, issues basically trauma. You know, you name the, the gamut of um, emotional issues that that we deal with, and and also issues in 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 sport. Yeah. Um, you know, sports people and and um, and others, they just want stuff that, that can work. You know, they don't necessarily um, all want to see the massive research base. That helps. Yeah. But they're just looking for what they can use. You know, and the and the, the top peak performers, they're just voraciously looking for anything that they can use to improve their performance. You know, and, and yeah. works quickly as well. They want very quick results, which traditional psychotherapy it can take quite a significant amount of time. Well, this is the thing that, you know, tapping for the, for the people who are able to get over their initial skepticism. And every area of, of, of science has had this when, when you have new things come in, you know, yeah. the, the, there's a, a skepticism. It's like, well, prove it. If you're yeah. going to make big claims, let's, let's see the proof. Well, now, you know, I, I started doing tapping in 1997. There mm -hmm. was no research. But now in, in uh, David Feinstein's most recent review, he reviewed 245 uh, studies and papers. You know, we, we, there's over uh, 115, um, you know, controlled studies mm -hmm. on, on tapping. And, uh, you know, and 99 point something percent of them document effectiveness, you know? So... Um, That's pretty good. I think even comparing it to sort of the gold standard CBT... Um, acceptance and commitment therapy. I mean, that's that's pretty high, isn't it? Well, the thing about acceptance and commitment therapy, actually, because it it was uh, promoted as the the next wave of, yep. of uh, third wave. CBT and so on, because yep. it actually attached to something that was already there, yep. it gained more acceptance before it had the research. Yeah. Okay, it didn't actually have the research, but it was kind of piggybacking and saying, well, it's kind of like this, but different. You know, so therefore it, it gained a lot of acceptability, um, but it, you know, brought in some some things which weren't uh, fully accepted in you know the traditional uh, scientific psychological community. So it was interesting to look at that uh, discrepancy. Now there's there's a bunch of reasons why tapping is um, 
has had more trouble being accepted. Yeah, by. that was going to be my next question to you. Yeah, well, it looks ridiculous yeah. for someone who hasn't actually seen it before. It's like, you know, the, 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 this looks like, oh, my gosh, what are you doing? You know, you're stimulating the body. Well, and, and because um, psychology has been fixated on the mind, you know, and, and so CBT isn't flavor of the month. It's flavor of the century. The, yeah, you know? yeah. That's so it. it has a long, um, long built up history of research. And, you know, we were all into the mind. But in recent years, there's been a lot more research on somatic stuff, on body stuff. And so there's there's now, apart from the research on tapping, there's a lot of research on, you know, on the influence of the body and, and particularly in the area of trauma. There's yeah, you know, if you don't if you don't involve the body in this, then you're gonna have trouble um, you know, ultimately helping a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And there are some great books about that, like Body Keeps the Score, and yeah, just the importance of working with the body, especially with trauma. I guess one thing I was curious about, Steve, is so we sort of mentioned tapping, we're talking about it, but a lot of people who might be watching don't actually know about tapping. So would you be able to quickly just run us through what tapping actually is? Yeah, okay. So so tapping is basically that, using your fingers yep. to tap on acupressure points on the body. So sure. the points that, that are used, they correspond to the points that are used in acupressure and acupuncture. Yep. Um, and... Uh, when you do that, there's a couple of different ways of doing it. One is that you can do that while you are focusing on a problem. Mm -hmm. And when you are focusing on that problem, usually you'll be feeling some of the feelings of that problem. And when you stimulate the points, it, it, there's a, a, a change in the body feelings. Yeah. And there's a, a very strong psychological backwash where you start being able to see things differently. It's kind of like when you have stuck feelings, you have stuck thinking. Mm -hmm. And so when, uh, when the feelings start to shift, you're able to, to uh, think differently about the problem as well. Yeah. Um, the process, while very, very simple, you know, there are many, many different variations of this around the world. Uh, the original, uh, uh, well, okay, they did use tapping in traditional Chinese medicine. This is another confounding factor because people then think, well, now we have to accept all the tenets of traditional yeah. Chinese medicine, yeah. which of course, a lot of people in the traditional medical and psychological models have problems with that. No, you don't. There's, you, know, you don't have to accept one theory about it um, just because you find a technique that works. Now we've got to make up better theories. Yeah. And you know, the, the early theories had some problems uh, with what was being postulated about what was going on and so on. And that's been mm -hmm. part of the problem, you know, the concept of energy, energy lines and all that kind of thing, that really upsets people. Yeah. And yet you can, uh, you can now find that there is a lot of evidence that tapping creates um, uh, physiological shifts. There's, you know, you have fMRI data, you have brain chemistry data, you have brain wave uh, data that, that can be shown. So you can say, okay, you know, we don't have to accept that particular theory. This can be seen to be operating through normal known physiological channels. Yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, there's a lot of reasons why it had trouble getting accepted, but the original um, psychological uh, approach using this was created by Roger Callahan, originally called Callahan Techniques. He was a clinical psychologist in the US and um, he really made the discovery because he had learned about these points and he had a lady who had a severe uh, water phobia, mm -hmm. so severe that she couldn't even look at a body of water without having a panic attack. And, uh, you know, she couldn't even have a bath. She would have to shower. Yeah. And, okay. uh, he, he was a cognitive therapist. He, he'd used cognitive therapy with her. He was also a hypnotist. He, yep. He'd used hypnotherapy with her. He had, you know, systematic desensitization, yeah. relaxation training, all the, the, the gold standard psychological and None treatment. of this was doing anything for her phobia. And he basically worked with her for about 18 months or so. Uh, when he found out about this, um, you know, these points. And uh, in, in one session, there was a moment where she was, you know, thinking about water, mm -hmm. you know, doing visualization and, you know, relaxation and all this kind of stuff. She thinks about water. She's got this horrible feeling in her stomach. Yeah. And he, he thinks, well, according to this system, there's a point under the eye, which is supposedly part of what's called the stomach meridian, the energy line that flows through the stomach area, you know, to 
you know, yeah, in China, bastardize the theory a little bit for you. Yeah, um, <laughs> trying to simplify it to, you know, um, anyway, he just thinks, what if I get it to stimulate that point? Will it influence what's happening in the stomach? So he gets it to tap under her eye. And uh, after like minutes, she says, it's gone. Yeah. And uh, he says, what do you mean? She says, it's gone. The feeling in my stomach is completely gone. And uh, then he says, okay, go, let's go test it. They've been doing the therapy at his home because he had a swimming pool and they were using that for the desensitization. Apparently she ran to the pool. She was so excited. And he got worried that she was going to jump in. And she says, yeah. it's okay, Dr. Callahan. I know I can't swim, you know. I just want to test this. And she went and splashed water on her face. And, and uh, you know, her phobia was completely gone. So this was really, um, well, it's going to focus your attention when you have a dramatic shift like that. Yeah. So then he started experimenting with other people with fears and phobias with tapping on that point. Mm. Only a few of them got the same kind of results, but there was enough results happening. Then he started um, branching out and having people stimulate other points. He came up with a, a bunch of theories about that. And, uh, you know, he called it Callahan Techniques. Now, then he changed it to thought field therapy. Yep. And that is one of um, the tapping approaches that's out there. Um, and then along came Gary Craig. Gary Craig is an engineer. This is also what upsets a lot of people because an engineer yeah. came and simplified the process yeah um, you know by this time callahan had come up with a number of different algorithms different sequences for different problems you know a lot of beliefs that, that he built into that system mm -hmm. this is what happens is sometimes our theories get in the way of our practice yeah it gets, so, gets a bit rigid yeah and and that's not to say that tft doesn't get excellent results it does yeah in fact you know all the, the um, approaches that use stimulation of these points that I've seen get results. And, you know, it's going to come out in the wash which one gets superior results for what reason and whatever, you know, and, and uh, everybody likes their particular way of doing it and for particular reasons. But anyway, Gary Craig uh, thought, well, instead of having to do all these different sequences for different problems, what about if we tap on each of the main points that are covered in all of these things on the upper body and on the hand. And so this process of stimulating these points and he, he basically came up with a kind of complete overhaul system. Yep. He called that EFT, Emotional Freedom Techniques. And that is the most well-known, most popular um, and most researched yeah, of yeah. The, the tapping approaches. And, uh, you know, I learned that in 1997. Um, you know, I went over to study with Gary Craig with my good friend, David Lake, who's a medical mm. practitioner who does psychological medicine. Sure. He, he got up on stage with his public speaking phobia and Gary Craig and him went through tapping on these points through all the different aspects of that fear. And he came back and he had no fear. And we spent the next, you know, 20 years traveling around together, teaching people. And he was able to get up on stage without any fear. Now, this is the difference between the results. Yeah. When you do, you know, like when you do exposure therapy, then you've got to go through, you know, you do it a hundred times and then you don't have as much anxiety as you did the first time, you know, and if you combine that with cognitive approaches, then, you, you know, you can do even better. But this was like one session. Yeah. And he could stand up in front of a group. And I, rem I remember because we came back to Australia, I invited him to join me at a workshop. He got up in front of 40 professional people in Melbourne introduced himself, turned around to me and said, I, I can't believe it. I don't feel any of it, mm. you know? And it's so weird as well, Steve, thinking about the classic cognitive approaches. After that much exposure, you may be able to handle the situation, but there can still be a significant amount you of stress and anxiety. Anxious. It's just you're more just about anxious. like accepting it. Oh, that's right. And in fact, um, exposure therapy doesn't work for everybody, you know? I, I, mm. I'm, Gary uh, told us about a guy that had done 400 combat jumps and he felt just as terror terrified that on the 400th one as yeah. he did on the first one, you know? Yeah, so there yeah. was no corrective shift in, in that situation. Yeah. Um, but generally for most people, exposure, I mean, exposure is a good uh, treatment. And in yeah. fact, you can combine exposure with, with tapping, uh, tapping yeah. and get great results. And in fact, most people do because mostly we're using imaginal exposure, and yep. we're having the person think about the thing that they fear and sure. we're having them tap on these points at the same time. And the tapping, you know, we now know um, it, it, it 
sends calming signals to parts of the brain. It actually changes the brain activity that's going on. It changes the brain chemistry. And so there's, there's some huge, uh, there are really huge body-based things that are happening from a very simple process. Yeah, and that's what I'm really interested in, Steve. That's what, I guess, attracted my attention to tapping. So before we talk about sports, I was wondering, would you be able to just quickly run through that research with us and just sort of, yeah, what does the body of evidence tell us about tapping's effectiveness? Okay, well, I yes, I do happen to have some slides that I use <laughs> in, oh, uh, love in that. the Thank workshop, you. and I'll share those with you as we discussed. Um, so kind of a summary, um, this... I, I now know that this is actually um, not 100% up to date, but you'll get the idea from, uh, from this. There really is a very uh, large evidence base which has developed on uh, uh, acupoint tapping or tapping on acupoints on the body. Um, it's now been researched by more than 200 people in 12 different countries, uh, over 65 randomized controlled trials, over 50 pre post outcome studies, Five meta-analyses. So, if you yeah, know anything wow. about, your, if you know your research, you know that a meta-analysis is a study which combines a number of studies and looks at the size. You know whether there's an effect. And yeah, the, size the gold, of the gold effect. standard. Yeah, and um, and and you know a number of reviews and so on and so on and so on. Um, now, again, the numbers are actually higher than than this. This was um, a summary from. Uh, ASEP. So I've given the website there for people who want to follow this up. Their, their yeah. website is energypsych.org, E-N-E-R-G-Y-P-S-Y-C-H.org. Yeah. Um, they have, they have um, a pretty up-to-date summary of the research on, on their website. And you can go there and you can see it categorized in terms of different, um, you know, the research that's been done on anxiety, the research on depression, the research on post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma, um, and so on and so forth. Um, categorized also in terms of um, how strong the research is in terms of whether it's gold standard or whether it's uncontrolled or whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, just case studies and so on. So, of yeah. course, the randomized control trials are the, the, more, um, the more interesting uh, and they are the, the gold standard uh, yeah. research. The results have been published in a, a, a large number of different peer-reviewed journals, including some of the most prestigious peer um, review journals on the planet. So um, the first thing of significance in terms of reviews, back in 2012, um, David Feinstein did a review of the research that had been done up until that time. And, and uh, he showed that, that tapping had met the um, evidence-based criteria, the Division 12 evidence-based criteria spelled out by the American Psychological Association for a number of conditions for phobias, test anxiety, PTSD, depression, public speaking anxiety. Yeah. Um, and so his review at that time covered 51 peer reviewed papers. 18 of those were randomized control trials, which included um, the study that we did actually, which was the first randomized control trial on, on using tapping for um, specific phobias of small animals. Yeah. He then um, updated that review in 2018, and that review um, looks at 100 peer-reviewed outcome studies. 51 of them by that time were randomized controlled trials, and uh, you know basically concluded that the yeah, what's now being called energy psychology. And so, you know, when we talk about uh, tapping, it's it's incorporated into uh, an emerging field which. Uh, which is called energy psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and so they talk about energy psychology protocols, but acupoint based, meaning the tapping protocols, because yeah, um, sure. you know, the, the, the field is broader than just tapping, but um, most of the research has actually been done on tapping. And the, the, you know, they've come out as rapid and effective and producing beneficial outcomes in a number of conditions. Mm -hmm. And now, fresh off the press, um, uh, Feinstein has actually just got a, um, a, another review which was published this year, uh, about a month ago. Um, and uh, in this new review, he reviewed 245 clinical yeah, wow. trials, meta-analyses, systematic evaluations, theoretical articles, you know, um, that included tapping on active pressure points. And he came, came up with six themes um, about uh, efficacy, speed, how durable the effects are, 
um, and the physio physiological effects that have sufficient empirical support now. Mm -hmm. Meaning, and his definition of that was that there are at least six clinical trials supporting each of these themes, and some of them have more, more than that. So he found that, that tapping is effective in treating a range of conditions. It's rapid compared to conventional treatments. There's been a number of studies comparing tapping to conventional treatments, particularly CBT. Mm -hmm. um, the results are durable and lasting. Um, they produce measurable changes in physiological markers, a number of different physiological markers that corroborate the, the, you know, the subjective reports of people using tapping. Um, the tapping has been shown to be a critical ingredient of the demonstrated effects because they have now done some dismantling studies. Um, and the tapping actually um, uh, does increase or decrease arousal in specific areas of the brain. That's actually been demonstrated as well yeah, through wow. the MRI studies and so on. So this is actually, you know, this is how far things have gone. Um, you know, uh, some of those things include, for example, you know, this study by um, uh, Peter Stapleton and her team, um, where they looked at the neural changes that occur after after using EFT tapping. Um, then, and you can you can see the the neural changes that in this particular study they're looking at food cravings and yeah. uh, the the um, they're kind of uh, probably wrong way around for before and after, but the the images on the right side uh, are, no, actually, excuse me, they are right. Um, the, the images on the left are the brain activity before doing the EFT when the person is um, uh, thinking about the crave food and then after um, the four weeks of EFT in that particular program. Yeah, so measurable brain changes just from four weeks of, of performing EFT. That's right, that's right. Yeah. And there's been a number of studies that have shown different neural neural changes from uh, from using tapping you know yep. um, there are studies that have shown um, significant reductions in cortisol which is stress chemical mm -hmm. and there are studies which have shown changes in brain waves as well yeah um, so there's there's really a um, a significant body of evidence yeah. now when you have a lot of studies then you you do a thing called a meta-analysis which is a, you know you combine the studies the studies have to have a certain um, you know, they have to be good enough. So um, for example, you have a number of randomized control trials that are the gold standard of research. Then you um, do a statistical analysis of, of, of those studies and, um, and you work out across all of these studies, whether there's an effect yeah. and how strong that effect is and whether it's a, a small treatment effect, a moderate treatment effect or a large treatment effect or no effect. Um, yeah. And so you need a, um, you know, the D score to basically um, to be, you know, if it was 0.2, it's going to be small. If it's uh, 0.5, it's going to be moderate. If it's 0.8 or more, it's going to be large. And uh, uh, tapping was found to have large effects in each of these three meta-analyses. So a separate one on the studies on anxiety, mm. um, very large effect for that for very large effect for depression and very large effect for PTSD. Yeah, PTSD, um, that's huge, that number. Oh, the results are actually uh, exceptional. Um, now, there was another, um, there was actually another meta-analysis done over here at uh, Murdoch University by Chris Lee and, um, oh, sorry, I, think of, I can't think of Gitterman's first name. Anyway, uh, Lee and Gitterman. And, um, and they, in fact, when they did their um, meta-analysis, they did two things. One is they excluded some of the, a couple of studies on PTSD because they said the, the results are too good. Too so good. we consider these studies, well, yeah, so they, they don't fit, so they're outliers. Yeah, yeah. So they excluded a couple of studies, um, a couple of the, the, with the best results. Mm -hmm. And they used a, a um, more stringent measure of um, uh, to show the effect. So 95% of studies, they use a thing called Cohen's D. Yeah. And um, there's another uh, uh, effect measure called Hedges D. It really requires you to, to get a much better uh, result to, and so you, you can be more confident when you, uh, when you look at that result. So even after excluding a couple of studies, which they considered outliers and using Hedges D instead of Cohen's D, 
they said that tapping has at least a moderate effect. And what yeah. I like about that is that they were approaching tapping from a skeptical uh, viewpoint mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and still uh, show that it has at least a moderate effect. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where things are. Um, when you look at the evidence, um, you know, the hierarchy of evidence that we have for, for science and we use in psychology, um, you know, meta-analysis is the top of, top of the pops. And, uh, you know, the gold standard is a randomized control trial. But if you do one randomized control trial, well, can that re be replicated? Yeah. Well, no, we need more than that. Yeah. You know, so there's been replication, in, you know, for example, the study that we, uh, we did on uh, small animal phobias, which found significant uh, results from a single 30 minute treatment with tapping, um, that has been replicated several times by independent investigators in other countries. And so this is what you really need before you can go, okay, this is not just someone saying this works. Yeah. You know, this is just not, not even a few people saying this works. This is not just, you know, I did a before and after, but then again, you know, I chose people who I already knew, mm. you know, it's, it's um, you know, more and more studies, larger and larger studies, well-controlled studies, all pointing in the same direction. And so, you know, that's where things are really at with, with tapping. There has been, as I mentioned, a number of head-to-head -head comparisons. Again, I might be not, uh, this is not totally up to date. I believe there's been nine studies now comparing tapping and CBT. Yep. Um, and uh, in, in, in those studies, they have found the results to be at least equivalent to the outcomes of CBT and exceeded them on some measures, particularly in speed. So when people are using tapping, they're tending to get results, the same results as CBT in less sessions yeah. um, with them. So yeah, so that's that's kind of where things are at. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch more, but we could spend all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could. And it's so interesting just how wide ranging the effects are. I mean, you have effects on a number of conditions, anxiety, depression, PTSD, phobias, but I guess as well, just it's clearly doing something to the brain neurologically. There are processes going on there. Well, and, that's um, to be demonstrated. So, you know, you can, you can look at, you know, you can, you can say, well, all right, you know, subjective results. Well, that's one thing. And then we have, then we have, you know, our standardized tests. All right, well, we've got results on standardized tests. Okay, that's more interesting, you know, because, you know, we, we, we know that they have reliability. We know that they have validity according to, you know, our research. Yeah. And then, you know, we're, we're, what about the controls of the research? Let's have a look at that and yeah. so on. Um, and, and, um, and even then, you know, you can siphon through the studies and you can go, okay, let's, let's knock a number of them on their head because they're not well controlled. And some of them, you know, they use groups that, that weren't randomized and so on. Um, and then, but when you show a physiological shift, mm -hmm. what are you going to do with that? Yeah. How, you know, how are you going to deny that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I guess I'm really interested, Steve. So clearly there's all this research around a number of conditions, but there's not as much, well, like not as much studies specifically looking at sports. So there are some out there, but yeah, the, maybe the literature real. isn't yeah, as wide not, ranging. Yeah. There so hasn't I guess been a lot of really good research in that area yet, and it's just that that's open for people like you if you want to get involved. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like from what I've seen, there are some studies, and they're really encouraging. The results are really promising. But yeah. I know you've worked with athletes and with high performers, and yeah, I was just wondering about your experience. If you could share um, maybe some of the athletes you've worked with and and how you've used tapping with them. Okay. Well. Tapping is spectacular for performance because it's spectacular for, uh, particularly for anxiety, which is prevalent in yeah. performance and impedes yeah. performance for lots of people. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are other issues that influence performance as well, psychologically and so on, you know, um, and uh, because tapping can, can help for a lot of those things, then it's going to help with performance. Yeah, you know, there are a number of sports that a small difference in tension could lead to a massive difference in performance. Yeah, and, those, know, like those old, one percenters. Old, what's that? Those one percenters. Oh, yeah. Well, but you think about golf, you know, like a tiny shift in, in tension can create a massive uh, difference in result. Yeah. And, uh, you know, these are the kind of classic things where people have, you know, they get the yips or they, you know, they, you know, they, they get it in, you know, they get into perfect position and then they can't putt the thing, you know, yeah. or whatever. And um, 
I've I've seen a number of you know anecdotes, but these are just specific individual cases, but dramatic results, you yeah. know, from from using tapping, and often very very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, first when I when I learned about tapping, I was actually working. I just started working with our local professional baseball team. Yeah, and. Um, so I thought, right, I'm going to introduce these guys to, to tapping. And the first um, guy that I introduced it to was, was uh, a pitcher. Okay, so this guy was, uh, you know, it's like, okay. And, and as I said, he's the real peak performers, the real elite athletes, they're voraciously like, what can I use? You know, who can help me? You can help yeah. me, right? Can, you know, so, that, um, so he's like, I'll give it a go, sure. And... Um, and uh, anyway, so he had a couple of things. One is he was, um, he was actually originally from the US and he'd come over here to play. And, um, and he had a couple of situations. One was like, if, if, if someone came out with an aluminium bat, right? So over there, they were using, um, they were using only wooden bats. And mm -hmm. over here, we had these aluminium bats. And yeah. he's, like, he's, call, he's like, if someone comes out with a tin bat, then I got, I, then, then I could do a really good pitch. And yeah. just because he does a wild swing, he could just hit it out of the park because he's yeah. using a tin bat, you know, instead yeah. of a wooden bat, where you have to actually, you have to perform better with a wooden bat, you know? Yeah. And so he'd have a bit of a kind of slump with, with that thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then there were certain, um, certain hitters. If they came out, he would go into, you know, he'd just lose energy. Yeah, into his and show. So we, yeah. just, we just combined focusing on those things. So that's imaginal exposure, yep. okay? Thinking about someone with a tin bat, you know, mm -hmm. then he gets this kind of oh, tin bat, you know, feeling yeah. and just tapping on these points, yeah. you know? And um, you know, that, that's basically 95% of the process. It's, yeah. it's that simple. Mm -hmm. And um, and then working with whatever else comes up. And uh, and we did that with, you know, these, these intimidating hitters who would come out, you know, the, the mm -hmm. really good ones and the arrogant ones. Well, his results before and after were like chalk and cheese. And, yeah. and he basically, um, after that, he, he started, um, he was through a number of games where nobody got a hit, basically. Yeah. And, you know, like a shutout. Um, he ended up with the most valuable uh, player of the, the uh, pitcher of the year for the Australian Baseball League. Um, it, was that in the, the same season's player. league? Yeah, in that, in that season. So you, oh, can wow. look, you, can, you can look at it before and you can look yeah. at it after in terms of, like, so before his earn run average was like, I don't know, two point something, three, whatever, whatever yeah. it was. After, I remember it was 0.87 for all the yeah. games after, you know, so like this part of the season and this part of the season. Yeah. And it was just a complete turnaround and everyone was astounded by, yeah. by the shift, you know. And, and this happens fairly regularly mm -hmm. when you use this on someone who's had a slump or they have a or they have a part of their game that that um that really causes them a a, a shift in performance yeah. you know so i've used it with um you know after that I, I i had an opportunity to use it with a netball player who'd been sent over came over to my state um you know she was a, a peak performer was being being paid the most that anybody been paid to play netball at that time but she'd gone through a complete uh, form slump. And uh, what had happened was because she was, you know, she was, everybody was looking to her to, to be the one that, that saved the team. Yep. Then she started worrying about every shot. Yeah, you know? the, pr the pressure increased and she became more internally focused. And the thing that she loved and that she did easily and did for fun, now was, now was sheep stations, you know? Yeah. And so... Um, Anyway, so we used tapping on that, and she was actually very skeptical. Mm -hmm. But when she went out on court, like she was down way in a slump, and and uh, you know, the, I, again, I can't remember the numbers, but she she was shooting shocking, you know, yep. like really shocking. And she went up above her peak in the very next game after after a session of tapping. Yeah, um, okay. you know, these are the kind of things that that you see a lot because um, the 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 shift can be quite quick. Yeah. Um, you know, we now study of people with the specific phobias. We just gave them a single 30 minute treatment and they all got better. Yeah. You know, and we have people who couldn't go in the room if there was a spider in the room or if there was a, a mouse in the room mm -hmm. and they could go in the room and they could, you know, go right up and hold the jar or, you know, touch the mouse or whatever um, from a single 30 minute treatment. 
Yeah. Um, now, this is not saying that the single treatment will be enough for everything, but mm -hmm. you can actually shift an aspect. So if there's an aspect, you know, if there's a very, very strong fear or a very sp strong thing, which is specifically triggered by just the one thing, yeah. that can shift very quickly. Um, and other things you work on over time, you know. So I've, I've uh, had the good fortune of working with people in about 12 or 13 different sports, you know. I've used it with, um, with AFL footballers, baseball, basketball, tennis, uh, swimming. Let me see, I was writing down a few things in golf, high jump, roller, roller skating, BMX, skating. bike riding, yeah. uh, <laughs> weightlifting. Yeah. Um, yeah, and... Um, really good results in, in all of those cases with those people yeah yeah so i guess like what i hear there steve so there's a whole range of sports different skills some are more open skills some are more closed skills i'm just wondering what sort of issues do you think tapping is most effective at targeting is there say an issue that's most effective or is it effective on sort of a range of um, issues or blocks that people come across in sports oh, look it's, it's it's classic results are on anxiety yeah okay and anxiety is a classic impeder of performance. Yeah. If you're dealing with depression or stuff like that, then you, you're dealing with a different animal unless you're talking about mild depression mm -hmm. or mild to moderate depression. So, yeah. um, you know, and that can happen for a number of reasons. So most athletes have parts of their game that, that are triggering for them that they, that they don't do as well. You know, there's certain situations, whether it's chipping onto the green or whatever it is, you know, in your particular sport, and your particular thing, there's a, there's a thing, or there's a situation, you know, that if, if you're in that situation, you know, everything goes to pot, you know? So, yeah. um, and, and that's where, you know, I would say that people are, are definitely believing their thoughts, mm -hmm. you know, so there's the cognitive element of that, but it's not just cognitive because there's an emotional attachment and there's a body component of that, okay? Yeah. So, you know, it's not that we're completely leaving the cognitive aspect out. We just realize that we're incorporating a body component and we incorporate the, you know, the cognitive approaches like the imaginal exposure and so on with that body process of stimulating the points. Um, so, yeah, so you can find that whatever that area is mm -hmm. that, that, that is causing that. Um, then people just go through confidence slumps. So confidence slumps and things like that or injury, huge Okay, yeah. coming back after an injury and, and so many people just get, they have so much trouble getting back to where they were before. Yeah. And of course, it's like, can I trust my body? Will I get mm. injured again? You know, all that kind of stuff is in the background. Yeah. And all of those aspects need to be treated using the, the, the approach, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a huge psychological component to injury. And you see it time and time again, athletes, the doctor clears them. They said the body's fine. Um, but for whatever reason, either um, it gets re-injured really easily or they just feel like inhibited. They feel like they can't perform at 100%. Yeah, so yeah, you've had yeah. some experience using tapping with those sort of... Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had a, um, a, um, a guy who was uh, coaching a lot of elite athletes in, uh, in high jump and he used to regularly send me... Uh, I, I saw several high jumpers who had that same kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, where the injury and they weren't able to, to, to get over the bar at the level yeah. that they had pre, uh, yeah. pre injury. And so we used tapping with, with that and they were able in, you know, I can think of three specific cases. They were all able to, to get PBs after, after learning tapping and using tapping. Yeah. And, you know, some people uh, that's a short term intervention and some people need to do it as an ongoing process because there's more, yeah. more for them to do, you know? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing, you know, when we talk about PTSD. Well, yeah. fine, tapping is great for a single incident trauma. And yeah. in fact, an, an injury is a, is, is a trauma. Yeah. Okay? So there's actually, you need to have, some of them are suffering a kind of uh, traumatic stress associated with that and, and have some lingering uh, attachments to what happened. And so they're, you know, they're, they're, they're getting kind of hooked back to, to what happened. Yeah. If you have a previously well person with a single incident trauma, then you're going to have a much easier um, treatment than if you have someone who has multiple traumas or complex traumas and, and, yeah. and that kind of thing. So again, you know, this isn't rewriting the book on the fact that there's going to need to be ongoing treatment for, uh, for some of those people, mm. but the process actually allows them to work through aspects and parts of that 
much more easily, much much more gently in a lot of cases, you know, with less chance of um, ab reaction and uh, flooding and so on. And uh, yeah, it's, it's elegant. They can take it in the situation, you know, so I, I, um, I teach people, um, oh, the, 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 um, the netball lady, by the way, apart from getting her form back, her form had slumped so badly that she'd been kicked out of the Australian team. So yeah. then her turnaround in her form was so dramatic that she got herself back into the Australian team and they went on and won the gold medal. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's the kind of thing, you know, this is what you come into the field for is to help people to do this kind of stuff. It's very rewarding, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and we worked using tapping along that, that, um, that pathway to get into, um, to, uh, you know, the gold medal match. And it was always at that, you know, it was always Australia, New Zealand, you know, and always really close. Yeah, and so it was very dramatic and, and a lot of tension, of course, and a lot of pressure on, on her to perform. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, I teach people to use tapping where they can tap like this, where they're yeah. tapping on the finger points. And, and nobody, nobody can see them tapping on the fingers. That's right. It's a yeah. much more discreet thing. And some of them do it, you know, they do it in the bathroom or the, the you know, the toilet before they go out or they're behind yeah. the bleachers or wherever it is. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually work with a golf, a golfer um, you know, I did a bit of work with the women's golf team and she's like, oh, I discovered that myself that if I flick those points, yeah. it calms me down. If I do a bad shot, it calms me down before I go to the next hole. Yeah. And so it's like, wow, you know, it, it, it's just like naturally people, are, some people have discovered, yeah. you know, if they do this, that, that it calms them. Or you rub so, your eyes when you're a bit distressed or you're just like, yeah, you, you touch your face like a lot. Exactly. Yeah. So these body things that we do, they're not, they didn't come out of nowhere. You yeah. know, so and, and they're fairly universal, like you know, like when your team doesn't score a goal and you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're just like, oh, <laughs> cover your face, yeah. So, um, anyway, so uh, yeah, I've had a lot of um, a lot of experience with it. It's very gratifying to use it with people with this mm. kind of thing, yeah. Um, you know, and and for me the performance in whatever area you know so i've used it with people who are in symphony orchestras i've used it with people who are ceos who you know um need to do presentations you know and this is an area too by the way yeah. oh my gosh well look at this look at recently um you know this is the, the the issue that's come up in tennis of of having to do the press conferences you know yeah and so this is a classic area where there are athletes who I, I, i've heard about holding themselves back because they didn't want to actually have that 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 exposure to to those kind of situations yeah it's almost like a what they talk about secondary gains hey it's if i do succeed then i'll have to do this press conference which i really don't want to do so maybe subconsciously that's, that's sort of getting in the way gain, that's a secondary problem yeah <laughs> you you say the secondary gain of having the problem yeah. is, is that i avoid that sure yeah 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 exactly because i mean yeah if they don't play at their best then they can avoid that situation so obviously there is that internal conflict going on it really is it really is you know and there are people all over the world that are holding themselves back for that reason i had a friend who came back from overseas he said oh, i think i'm ready to be a general manager now mm -hmm. i'm like well you were ready before what do you mean yeah. he said yeah but i was too scared he said at the end of the year you have to do the speech to the troops you know 150 people and i couldn't do it yeah you know? well you know I, have, I i had another friend who i actually taught tapping to and he was he he had that same kind of thing and he was able to take the promotion and go do national presentations because he didn't have the fear anymore yeah and i think that's a huge barrier is that fear and anxiety that when we dream big and we think big that puts us off actually going for it but if we can look get past that fear and that anxiety the world just seems to open up. And it sounds like with your experience, with your clients and with athletes, a similar thing has happened. Absolutely. Well, the mind is always going to go, you know, we, we have the mind, which is, which is oriented towards worst case scenarios. Yeah. And, so on. And, yeah. and that's fine. It's just that there's a, you know, I mean, in act, they talk about fusing with that thought, you know, yeah. I would say with, you know, and, and we're not far off in terms of, of theory. It's like, okay, you can have the thought, but if you if you attach to the thought, I would say you have an emotional attachment to the thought. And, yeah. uh, and there's a body component of that mm -hmm. because the feelings are experienced. That's where their experience is in the body, you know? Yeah. It's not in the mind, okay? So you attach to that scenario and then you feel it as if it's real. 
And yeah. so if, if you do the tapping and then, you know, you're, you're focusing on that thought that stirs you up and then the body calms down, you know, yeah. there's, there's calming messages going to the amygdala and so on. This is, this is what we presume is happening. And, um, and lo and behold, now you, you have the thought and you're not attached to it anymore. You're not fused to it. And that shift has occurred without us having to challenge it cognitively, without us having to, you know, do mental gymnastics or whatever, yeah. just simply tapping on these points. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fantastic approach. Simple. Sounds like it's very quick to work. I guess what's coming to my mind when I'm hearing this, Steve, is how did the athletes react to it when you um, when you started tapping? Were they a bit skeptical? Were they like, oh, this this feels weird? What was that like? Well, uh, some of them, yes, and some of them, no. Uh, yeah. Some of them are, you know, uh, are, are quite willing uh, to try something new. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, it's like everybody, you know. Every, some people Some people just won't look at it you know no matter what because they know the truth i've got the one true thing you know whatever yeah, yeah. and um and others will look at it um you know i learned the hard way that because i you know i was very evangelical and you know everybody should be doing this yeah you know, yeah now 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 i've calmed down a little bit about that <laughs> um, and i did present it to the whole baseball team and mm-hmm. there were some of them was like oh no mm. and, and some of those guys didn't use it yeah. And then others, you know, they came and did sessions and they used it and they were uh, very pleasantly surprised, you know? Yeah. And I guess one thing I'm thinking, Steve, what do you think, I guess when I've talked to my friends about it, similarly, I might be accused of being a bit evangelical myself because I've experienced a lot of benefits using it in sort of my personal life. Um, what do you think? And the big question they ask is what's the mechanism what what in okay. your in your opinion what do you think is yeah like the okay. main mechanism I, I, I actually have an answer to that okay so this is again it's still theory okay so um let me share my screen again if it's all right yeah yeah um so the very next slide is mechanisms yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay now this is theory all right so um david feinstein i'm i'm, I'm referring to his uh reviews a lot because yeah. he's really translating a lot of the research and uh, summarizing the research and critically evaluating the research. And, and, um, and by the way, you know, um, that um, 2012 review of his was published in the American Psychological Association's own journal. We're yeah. talking about, wow. you know, like one of the top most prestigious journals on the planet yeah. um, in which he's uh, showing that it had met the evidence-based criteria. Yeah. Um, so in his 2018 review, he put forward these two hypotheses. Number one, that it sends regulating signals to brain areas which are aroused when we imagine the problem. Okay? Mm-hmm. So when you, um, when you use imaginal exposure and uh, you know, there are areas of the brain that get activated by that, just as shown in, in Peter Stapleton's research, you know, they get the food craving, the areas are activated. Mm -hmm. Then you do the tapping and then that's sending regulating signals to the brain areas that are aroused by that and and calming things down and and changing that activity. The second hypothesis is because of the, you know, the the research is coming out on uh, memory reconsolidation and more recently memory integration. And so um, this theory is that the uh, the tapping is actually modifying maladaptive emotional learnings at their neural foundations. Now, mm-hmm. this is the research on memory reconsolidation showing that, you know, we used to believe that we have a brain pathway, you can't change it. Mm-hmm. Well, now they've shown that it actually can change. And so, um, you know, this hypothesis is that, is, is that, that uh, tapping is actually getting involved at that level. Um, so I'm not going to go into those um, uh, studies in detail and, mm-hmm. and go there and, and really David is much better at explaining this than I am. Yeah. I'm, just, I, I'm a practical person who likes to do things and likes to find out how to use them. And I like to have a working understanding and I want to know it works. You yeah. know, I'm interested in results and then I, I want to have a working understanding of what's going on. And I have my own theories about what's going on and, and, and so on. Um, you know, but the, this is the challenge, you know, The other thing is people will go and look at Wikipedia and they'll take that as gospel when in fact the research isn't even shown on there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, but apparently if you write for Skeptical Inquirer, that means that you can violate the guidelines of Wikipedia and put whatever you like on there without actually including the real research. Because anyone who wants to really go and look at the truth and wants to go and and look at the the studies 
and and look at the uh, you know the the amount of people that are doing them, the quality of the research, the amount of it that, that there is, the um, the number of different peer reviewed journals that are included, including some very prestigious ones. Um, then they're going to have a very different picture to what's, for example, on Wikipedia, because that's not representing the truth. Yeah. It's just not representing the real research. And it's, you know, it's a strange business. But, uh, you know, I learned this when we first put our, our study up. I thought, you know, it's a really good study, well controlled. Um, you know, and even when G Gitterman and Lee, for example, they, they looked at the studies in the meta-analysis and they gave them rankings. And ours had got one of the top rankings because it was a really good study. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, and, and we followed the rules. It was like, I'm like, well, you know, will this actually work? Mm -hmm. Will it actually do what it promises to do? Well, it did in bucket loads, you know. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, um, so what was, gonna, what was I starting to say? Got, long, got lost a little bit there. The mechanisms. <laughs> No, okay. You are you were asking originally about mechanisms, but I was saying something about um, you know the acceptability of research and yeah. uh, and uh, anyway. Oh, okay. So when we did our research, yeah, that's it. Okay. So when we did our research, when we submitted it to the first journal, the the reviews that came back were so critical and so um, comprehensively critical. I was astounded. I'm like, really. <laughs> And, yeah. and, and one person, one of the reviewers had more, um, <coughs> had more references to his review mm -hmm. of our study than I and had in my dissertation. Wow. So I thought, well, hang on. I'm going to start again. Hang on. So Steve, um, yeah, I guess like sort of summarizing what you've said there, I, I sort of feel your frustration that despite really good quality research, there is a lot of... Um, a lot of resistance. And I guess so all the aspiring sports psychologists or people who work in performance hearing this and maybe are interested in learning more about tapping, I'm just sort of curious, what advice would you have for them or how could they find out more about tapping? Well, I wouldn't say don't be skeptical because I was skeptical, okay? The true definition of skeptic is needs proof, yep. right? And so the skeptic will actually look at it and look at the evidence. So I would just say, have a look at the evidence. It's, it's out there, you know, <clears throat> and, and um, don't just dismiss it out of hand. And then if you're willing, have a go at using it because you've experienced it. I've experienced it. You know, I've been studying psychology, like I said, just about my whole life. Mm -hmm. And there's only a few things that work at home. And this works at home. Yeah. It works for me. It works for my wife. It's worked with all of our kids. Absolutely fantastic to help them to get over their fears, their um, anxieties. You know, their night terrors, all that stuff, just using this tapping. So, um, you know, have an open mind, but be skeptical. Yeah. You know, sometimes you can be so open minded, your brain drops out. Mm -hmm. There, not everybody who's using tapping is using it what I would consider in legitimate ways. So, have a look at the people that are using it in those ways who are, you know, serious about uh, and scientific about it. Yeah. Um, because there's people who will make wild claims about it and so on, mm. and, they, and they they have theories which are just are crazy, you know, yeah. and so on. So um, have a look at the. You know, I would recommend going to ASEP's website, um, yeah. energypsych.org. <laughs> look at the actual research. Um, go and uh, you know maybe uh, learn it from someone who who uh, you know has been trained and has experience in, in the areas that you want to use it in yep. and give it a go, you know? Yeah. And it doesn't um, take much to try. Yeah, exactly. And my understanding is, so you offer some training for that as well, Steve, don't you? How, if people were interested, how can they sort of reach out to you or um, get further training on it? Okay. So we have a couple of websites. Um, we have the original one we set up, which is eftdownunder.com, eftdownunder.com. And, um, and I have this new approach that I use called intention tapping, which, uh, which you know about, um, and that's intentiontapping.com. And so, um, you know, those two websites will have all the stuff that we're doing and the programs that we're running that are coming up and so on. Um, the intention tapping is the newer approach. And so we'll ultimately that will be the place to go to get the, the, um, the newest information. 
we are training people who are you know being certified in that particular approach um, and we have them in seven different countries already yeah. um, i just finished a, a training for a couple of uh, french uh, speaking groups and we're looking at setting up one for germany next year um, before covid we were traveling all over the world doing uh, doing workshops but mostly it's happening online at the moment until we can all get out and get together again yeah yeah beautiful and i guess sort of to give people something to go home with if they did want to try tapping how would they try it on themselves would they just just tap the points and think about the problem do you think that's the easiest way to introduce someone to the experiential component of tapping um well it's good to try it on something so if you have like a body tension or something like that yeah. you know because most people have got tension in their body that you know if they really just scan through they'll notice that there's tension somewhere or something like that mm -hmm. and so you can just you know notice what's what's happening and you can just tap on the points yeah. and um and then you can just notice what happens next yeah and what what that does now if you want to um, you know try it on an issue you can think of something that upsets you or that's something that worries you and you can tap on these points and then again you just use a mindful approach so we combine you know using mindfulness yeah. um, and just noticing what's happening in the body or what's happening in the mind and if you do that then you'll notice that things are shifting yeah. and so you know the feelings will start to change and, and move and I believe that's what's meant to happen. Feelings are meant to move, you know? Yeah. They're not meant to be stuck. You're not meant to be kind of hooked into one feeling every time you think about that one thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so if you think about that one thing and you do the tapping on the points and you do enough of it and you just notice all the different ways that that moves and shifts and maybe there's different thoughts connected to it and maybe there's different feelings connected to it. Maybe there's different emotions, different body sensations. And you just keep following and applying it until you feel differently about that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And I guess my last question for you, Steve, I really appreciate you taking this time out is for, like from a duty of care point of view, are there any contraindications with tapping? Are there any um, presentations that maybe we should avoid tapping in your opinion? Well, I just wouldn't be using it for self-help on, on severe trauma. I would yep. really be working with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and tapping isn't going to rewrite the rules on things like schizophrenia and stuff like that. Those people can be helped using tapping, but it's not going to um, get rid of schizophrenia or, or whatever, or be the treatment, you know, that cures bipolar or, yep. or whatever. Those things, um, you need good therapy and you need people who have good experience and, and qualifications to work with those. Um, that's not to say that sufferers can't get some benefits from using, um, from using tapping for self-help. But I wouldn't be approaching severe trauma without, um, you know, working with uh, with someone who can help you to go through that. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks, Steve. That's all the questions I have for you today. And I guess to anyone listening and interested in learning more, I would really encourage you to check out Steve's website and his resources because I personally found him a wealth of knowledge and I would recommend it. Thanks for coming, thanks. Steve. Thanks, James. It's, um, it's great. And I really appreciate, you know, the opportunity to put this out to more people. So... Yeah, spread the word.